All right, and we are live. Hey, everybody, at Just Lean In. I could not be more excited about who we have brought today to speak to you, his incredible wisdom of many, 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 many years of working with clients. He is a psychologist. Is that correct, Dr. Cohen? Correct. Yep, he is a psychologist. Um, I'm going to have him share his background with all of you. But what fascinates me about this gentleman is that he really focuses on the inner bully and self-sabotage. And if you've been following Just Lean In in our group, you will know that I come on quite often and talk about self-sabotage and what it and how it affects my life. You know, when that it comes to binging, when it comes to starting to get close to hitting my goal. And once I start to hit my goal, I literally will do things counterproductive to go back to that feeling and state of failure. And I just, I, I think this is a problem that a lot of us experience, but we don't really understand why we do what we do. So the fact that you guys are going to get to listen to an expert who's also written a few books, and I'm going to be personally um, working with him starting next week on my own inner bully and self-sabotage issues. Um, he can share with you how you can do that at the end. This is going to be an extremely informative, informative call. And please invite your friends to come on it. And if you're not able to watch it now, watch it later. Um, Dr. Cohen, thank you so much for being on today's call. Tell us a little bit about yourself and then tell us, you know, what, what does it mean? What is an inner bully? And, and what is self-sabotage? Well, first, thanks for the intro. And we am really glad to be here. So uh, I, as Emily just mentioned, I'm a psychologist. I've been in practice. I can't believe it. It's over 40 years now here in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And what I equally can't believe is how much I still love that I do what I do. And I consider myself incredibly blessed to be able to say that. So my practice is mostly psychotherapy, but I also have a program I call Focus Topic Coaching, which is a one-on-one -on -one psychologically oriented coaching program. And one of the topics certainly I address is none other than self-sabotage on the weight loss front. So I also have two books published. One is called Inner Blocks to Losing Weight. That one is clearly mainly about issues, psychological struggles on weight loss. The other, which we'll get now used as a segue to talking about the inner bully, that one is called Your Self-Sabotaging Inner Bully, Standing Up to It Once and For All. Okay, so the concept of the inner bully, let me first say, most people that I speak with, whether it's my clients, whether it's people when I give talks to, people who talk to me about my books, most people are fine with the term inner bully. I just want to say at the outset, there are other terms that other people will use that are basically synonymous with inner bully, may resonate a little bit better. For example, some people use the term inner critic, some use shadow, some use dark side, some use the tapes, demons, you name it. Just so anyone who's, who's here today listening in, I'm going to stick with inner bully, but if one of those other terms or your own creative term resonates better, just know we're ultimately talking about the same thing. What are we talking about? Sticking with the term inner bully, it's a part of our subconscious. We all have this part of our subconscious. And the way I frame it is that in this part of our subconscious, there's a negative force. Obviously nothing that really exists. It's a metaphor, but this negative force exists in all of us. And the purpose of that force is solely to sabotage us. And self-sabotage occurs in two ways, in our thoughts and in our actions. So starting with self-sabotaging thinking. What I mainly mean by self-sabotaging thinking is any kind of thinking we do that is basically self-critical, self-doubting, self-judgmental. That is the type of thinking that can get us to spiral down, to end up experiencing a lot of anxiety. It can be depression and not only just clinical, it can also affect our self-esteem and self-worth. That's what I mean by self-sabotaging thinking. Then is also certainly the category of self-sabotage in our actions. 
which is in different contexts of our lives where we can do things. Self-sabotaging actions means action. There are things we're doing. So take the context, for example, on the job. It would be certainly self-sabotaging action if, for example, you're often late to work, you miss assignment. That's obviously pretty self-sabotaging on the job. In personal love relationships, doing things like cheating, lying, gaslighting, anything that in actions can sabotage a relationship. Obviously, those are examples of self-sabotage. But in terms of specifically weight loss, what I mean by self-sabotage in terms of weight loss or how, again, I define it or frame it in this context is three things that you can do as whatever program you're on for food control, for exercise. The three things I'm about to mention that are in the framework I come from, the essence of self-sabotage in terms of weight loss, I put under the heading of a term I call addiction to self-rebellion, okay? What do I mainly mean by self-rebellion? Well, we all know the term rebellion, but I wanna tell you how I use it because I have a kind of working definition of rebellion that I, I really stick with and make what I lean into. Rebellion in this framework gets defined as very simply, doing the opposite of what's in your best interest to do. That's the definition of rebellion that I'm coming from here, doing the opposite of what's in your best interest to do. Well, to apply that specifically to self-sabotage on the weight loss front, it really has three contexts. And they are, number one, eating more than you should. Number two, eating things you shouldn't. And number three, not exercising when you said you were going to. So anytime, whether it's at a meal, whether it's at a snack, whether it's on your plate, whether it's a hand food, if you go ahead and you are on some program or, or your own self-tailored program for trying to lose weight at any meal or snack, when you eat more than you should, when you eat things you shouldn't, or when you don't exercise when you said you were going to, that fits the definition of what I mean here by self-rebellion. Those are all acts of self-rebellion that are all acts of self-sabotage. And the more that you're doing that kind of self-rebelling, then the more you are mired in sabotaging yourself. And you know from experience, as so many people do, it virtually guarantees that sooner or later, you are going to have setbacks, you are going to stay on that roller coaster ride and end up as frustrated as no doubt you get that you start regaining the weight. And then of course that just spirals down more. So that's what I mean by self-sabotage. It's really the self-rebellion piece on the eating and exercise front. Let me ask you this question, Dr. Cohen. So sure. Could this be a legitimate statement? If I make a commitment to do something different that I've been doing and to change a habit and I don't go through with it, could it be I don't go through with it because if I because I'm afraid I'm afraid of not succeeding or is it because I'm afraid that succeeding is going to be a feeling that I'm not used to or does it mean that I'm addicted to the feeling of failure? It's, it's a really good and it's a really important question, Emily, because the answer really, in, in a way, is a combination of those things. So let me go right with that and, and sort of elaborate on what I mean by that. One of the things that is part and parcel of having an inner bully that steers you to self-sabotage, by the way, it may, of course, not only be on the weight loss front, there may be other contexts in your life in which you also get caught up in self-sabotage, just to throw that in as an aside. But in any context of self-sabotage, whether it's weight loss or in any other situation, part of what's going on inside, yes, there can be an anxiety issue, and I do want to address that. Heck, I have a whole chapter in my weight loss book on the subject of the issue of anxieties that can kick in about losing weight, much less about even you know, keeping it off. So where I wanna specifically go with that though is, in this framework I come from, there are three basic messages that come from our inner bully. And they all have something to do with the word deserve. And that's really key here. So I'm gonna sum up the three basic sabotaging messages 
almost no one is conscious of having these messages. But these messages are there in our subconscious exerting a self-sabotaging influence. And the three messages are, number one, and they all begin with the words, I feel like. So the first one is, I feel like I don't really deserve to be happy and get what I want. And that's not only in terms of weight loss, in almost any aspect of life. I feel like I don't deserve to be happy and get what I want. Second message, again, I feel like. I feel like when I mess or screw something up in my own mind, I deserve some kind of punishment. Where, quick aside, what does punishment mean in this context? Punishment means painful, negative feelings like guilt, like embarrassment, like failure, like regret. That's the emotional or psychological punishment that goes with the idea, I feel like if I mess or screw something up in my own mind, I deserve some kind of punishment. The third message that goes with this is actually the biggest challenge of all, because that message is from that inner bully of ours. I feel like I don't have the right to challenge the first two messages. So that third message that's saying, I feel like I don't have the right to challenge the first two is a trap. It traps you into believing the first two, that you don't have a right to challenge those two messages. So those are the three key sabotaging messages. Again, they're not conscious. They're in our subconscious, but they exert a very sabotaging influence. Now, in terms of weight loss specifically, so as you're doing pretty well, maybe, you know, losing some pounds, staying pretty disciplined, not rebelling much, if at all, really getting those things under control. So you're obviously on a positive path. Unfortunately, and all too typically, what can happen at some point? Most of the time, it's not obvious. What, if anything, is triggering the beginning of a setback? But of course, setbacks can start to occur. Then, of course, they can escalate and things go the wrong direction. At the point at which that sabotage is really starting to take hold, what, from the perspective I come from, what you have to look at, what you have to be mindful of is those three messages, those three deserved messages are starting to become more powerful inside. So what's kicking in more is really starting to feel like Again, the message, I feel like I don't really deserve to be happy and get what I want. I feel like if I mess or screw up something in my mind, I deserve some kind of punishment. And again, I'm not allowed to challenge those messages. Well, let's especially zero in on that first message. That belief inside, I feel like I don't really deserve to be happy and get what I want in life. Well, as you move a little closer and a little closer, to reaching the point you want to reach in terms of weight loss, if that message is kicking in inside, and if you are starting here and there to sabotage yourself, well, then two things are happening. That first message is getting stronger. I don't really deserve to be happy and get what I want. So you're starting to get a little closer, therefore a little closer to getting a little better self-esteem going, getting to feel like there's a possibility you can be happier with your life but that message is in there saying, no, nah, you don't really deserve that. Then also, if you do start some sabotaging, chances are you're going to feel guilt. Chances are some feeling a little bit of failure starting to set in. And then again, that part of that message that says, and now you deserve some kind of punishment. Well, what's the punishment? Stretching the word, but still under that kind of broad heading, the punishment becomes that you start escalating the sabotage. And so you rebel again, and a little more, and a little more. And the next thing you know, there you are backsliding. And what is that backsliding doing in the eyes of the inner bully? The inner bully is winning. The inner bully is win winning because it's really got you deep down believing. See, I told you, you don't really deserve to be happy and get what you want. See, I told you, you deserve some punishment as you start messing up. In this case, messing up on your discipline about losing weight. You put that all together and there can be the negative momentum of backsliding more and more. And there inside of you is your inner bully. It's in its glory. You're paying the price. It's in its glory. 
this is so powerful. You know, for those of us that are on here that are, are religious, it's almost that same thing. It's like you got the bad guy telling you things and telling you you don't deserve it. And then you have and then you have who you believe and who you worship telling you the good things. I'll give you an example that happens with a lot of us and myself. So we make a commitment. We we get on this this new weight loss diet. The first few days we're feeling amazing. We're following the steps. We're checking in with our coach. We're doing our workouts. We're weighing daily. We're seeing results. And then comes something happens around day four or five when we 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 start to see some results. Maybe the scale doesn't quite move like we think it should be. Maybe we get a glance at ourselves at the mirror in the mirror and. And for some reason, we're not seeing the good things that have occurred, but we're seeing negative. And we start telling ourselves, you know what? I can't do this. You know, I can't do this. I'm not, I'm, this is not for me. You, you, I will tell you this. You'll quite often find very, very overweight people saying, I just love food. I love food. And I have zero interest in talking to you about, about changing because I love food and I'm happy in my body and I'm happy with who I am. And I think that's great that you're happy, whatever weight you are, you should be. But I think sometimes it's a front um, because they don't want to go and make those changes. I'll give you an example that happened to me recently. I struggle. Well, I, I currently have challenges with rising early in the morning Mm -hmm. and Jen, Jen and I did a coaching call with, um, with someone that was saying to me, you've, that's a story you've created. The, your story is that you cannot wake up at 6 a.m. because you will feel bad by 1 p.m. And, you're not, and your story is that you're a night owl. And it is, it's a story I've created since childhood. So I think a lot of us create these stories in our heads that stop us in our tracks. Is that something that you agree with or? Yeah, very, very much so. What what though happens as that story is, and it's not just created, obviously, it's also perpetuated, is that at any point, as that story may be moving forward, but if self-sabotage is also happening, one of the things that it's it's so important to keep in mind about what self-sabotage does, psychologically speaking, and most people don't think about it, aren't steered to think about it aren't guided to think about it, self-sabotage is truly toxic for self-respect. Besides the other things that self-sabotage is very troubling about. So if someone is on the right path, but then something again starts kicking in, the inner bully is kicking in inside, and you do start to regress and do start to slide, as each step each backward step is happening. Every backward step, not consciously usually, but on a subconscious level is causing another little loss of self-respect. Nobody can respect themselves for sabotaging themselves. Prime example, just as a quick aside, is almost really any kind of addiction, not just addiction to food by any means. So just to take the example, if somebody has a drinking problem, let's say, well, what happens for people who, whether it's you know the substance of drinking or any other kind of substance, in the middle of the act of the substance, who's thinking consciously or mindfully about self-respect? Nobody. Whether we're talking a substance like alcohol or a drug or food, in the middle of the addictive compulsive act itself, nobody's thinking self-respect. Because if you did, If you really were mindful of it, it would give you, it doesn't guarantee, but it would give you a fighting chance to stop the act right there, to nip in the bud. If it's drinking, drinking more at that moment, you should. If it's food, to stop, not necessarily stop eating entirely, but, you know, even put half a portion aside so that the amount you're eating is still a reasonable amount. Self-respect is something that unfortunately the thought of the reminder of i'll tell you when it usually kicks in maybe five minutes later maybe a few hours later suddenly you realize wow how can i respect myself for how much i just sabotage myself and at that moment when you realize you've really done a number on that piece of your self-respect well 
guess what? It's too late. And it's too late in terms of you're already engaged in the self-rebellious addictive act of, again, eating more than you should, things you should, no, you didn't get to exercise. But there's another negative part too here. That sense of a loss of self-respect when it hits you. And by the way, quick aside, talking about self-respect. It can also be a conscious thought of, of, again, I've mentioned the term regret, failure. Five minutes later, you can really regret it. It's still kind of connected to self-respect. But the other negative piece is it also, that's not gonna help you now, what you just did five minutes ago or two hours ago. Unfortunately, it also doesn't usually deter from the next time there's an opportunity to not self-rebel, you still go ahead and self-rebel anyway. And, and part of the point you brought out there, Emily, is the pleasure of food. I mean, at any weight, let's call it like it is. I, I don't remember the first time I heard it, but you know, it's kind of obvious. Food is one of life's simplest pleasures. It requires almost no effort. It doesn't require being in a relationship. You know, you go to the cupboard, you go to the refrigerator, there it is, easily available pleasure. And so as determined as somebody can be to lose weight, I think we all know that as much a challenge as any about trying to stay on track and stay disciplined about losing weight and not sabotage yourself is that it is a very simple pleasure. And, Dr. and just Cohen, sure, I have a question uh, for me personally, and maybe the crowd. How oh, I think I have high self esteem, but some of my closest friends have pointed out that maybe I don't. How do you develop self respect for yourself? Well, I got a couple of things I want to say on that, Emily. First of all, in, in the way I work with the self type issues. I make a distinction between self-esteem and self-respect. So let me go there first, and I'll specifically zero in on the self-esteem part first. So, and I talk about this in my book. I believe there really are, in a sense, two, two types or two categories of self-esteem. So I call one of them the kind of popular traditional meaning of self-esteem, which I think it's safe to say is physical appearance. I think it's pretty safe to say for most people, when they think of self-esteem, they're especially thinking of their physical appearance. So the usual traditional definition of self-esteem is about how you look on the outside. Point being, there is, at least in theory, unfortunately doesn't usually come up much in practice, there is another possible definition of self-esteem and it gets to the internal. And that's the definition of self-esteem. I always talk to people about it, is I call it the preferred definition only in the sense of not just I prefer, I wish it was the preferred definition. Because what I mean by the internal piece of self-esteem is what you really like about yourself on the inside. The positive, likable personality traits you have. That when you think of those positive traits, you can say to yourself, here's what I like about me on the inside. That aspect of self-esteem, unfortunately, socialization, conditioning, being what they are up to this day. Socialization and conditioning are to make self-esteem hinge much more on the external piece. So if you're not feeling very good about your physical appearance, well, given that's what so many people, again, are steered to make the primary definition of self-esteem be, you lose sight. You don't stay mindful, hey, there's an internal piece of self-esteem that really counts and it really needs to count a lot more than it does. So if you don't focus or stay mindful at all on what you like about yourself on the inside, you're really then pretty much at the mercy of the definition of self-esteem remaining, how you feel about how you look on the outside. It's so important when I'm working with people on trying to stay on track, cutting down on self-sabotage on weight loss, self-esteem is one of the biggest issues I get to. And I so play up. People need to make, and it's kind of a straightforward idea. Just the inner bully doesn't like people doing it. You gotta make a list of what you like about yourself on the inside. 
one word adjectives, make a list, get input from someone else who knows you well, just to even add a few items to the list. And then every day or nearly every day, you look at that list and you remind yourself, I really have some things here that I'm really worth on the inside. It's never gonna outweigh how much self-esteem, the other piece is still gonna hinge on physical appearance. We all know that. But at least you give yourself a chance to counterbalance it, at least to some degree. Let me so, just also. This is so powerful. Yeah. I have so many things I want to say. Yeah, and, I can, a, I say can I just say one more I thing? Just, I'm about to cry. Like, I really am. Go ahead, Jen. Well, quick on self respect, Jen. Let me just throw this out real quick. So, just quickly to make the point self respect is not about the internal and external appearances, if you will, what you like. Just to say it, self respect is things you're doing and your day-to-day -day actions that you can respect yourself for, things like effort, kindness, courage, goals met, just to make that point. Go ahead, Jen. Yeah, so, um, no, this is super interesting. And I think, you know, it was it's taking me back to um, when I was in my, my early 20s, I did a lot of self-sabotaging of my fitness journey, which was um, a fitness journey to the bodybuilding stage, actually. And it was keeping me really stuck. Um, it, there was a lot of parallels to my business career. I went to business school undergrad. I was, I'm an econ major and a lot of my peers were progressing further in their careers faster. I had the aspirations to do that, but my mind, I had all this, I had a lot of inner bullying going on. I, it, so I, I have two questions for you. Um, one, where does the inner bully come from? Is it from trauma? Because mm. I, I think like, I, I don't know that I ever completely figured that out, but I think I, I, I kind of made those things. And then um, building on the point that you were making, so it's a separate question, but related, you know, you, you're talking about, you know, finding the things that you like about yourself. One of the things that I did as a part of personal development, this was a, a technique that somebody taught me, was writing affirmations. So it would, I would always do, even if I didn't believe it initially, I would always write the opposite of what I felt. So in business meetings, I'd often feel shy and weak and um, unimportant and things like that. So I would write, I am important and valuable and I'm strong and beautiful. And I would just write that over and over and over again, day in and day out. And until my brain started to, to believe it. Now I did a lot of other things, but do you believe in that? Um, so those are two questions. So where does it come from? And then do you believe in, is, is that a, a good practice? And is there anything else along those lines that we can leverage to help? Sure. I'll address the second one first, then more than willingly, I was actually going to get to the question that you asked, so that's great. Um, I think affirmations are a gift that we give ourselves. And I think it's especially important, like you were saying, you did, Jen, and some degree, you know, you may still do certainly, is the repetition of the affirmations. You know, it's kind of like the equivalent of learning a physical skill with muscle memory. This is kind of, you know, in a mental, emotional muscle memory. The more you say it, the more you have a chance to believe it. And the more you start to believe it, the more you're, in a sense, standing up to that inner bully because your inner bully is not wanting you to believe these affirmations, doesn't want you to do them at all. So it's the yes, the repetition of them really is a blessing. So totally on board for doing that. As for where the inner bully comes from. So there's a couple of pieces to this. The generalization I'll, I'll start with is the inner bully comes from, and what I mean in this case really comes from is develops very early on in life. There is an inner bully developing in the first couple of years of life as I look at it. And where the inner bully is coming from is from the types of communications that we get, whether it's one parent, both parents, guardians, whoever are the primary child years. Now, what I want to, there's a couple of things here I, I want to make clear. There can be very loving, supportive communications we get from our parents. We'll make that a given. Unfortunately, there, of course, can be negative communications as well. And where the inner bully starts building its strength is from two sets of negative communications. And I call one of them direct hits and the other one is sneak attacks. 
and let me kind of cover both. So what I mean by direct hit negative communications are communications that are directly critical, belittling, and even go to name calling, the kind, unfortunately, that there are enough people in the world that can hear some pretty direct put downs that they may get from at least one parent. And all it takes is one parent as positively communicating as the other parent may be. If that other parent is throwing it, you never mount anything, you're stupid, the kinds of things that obviously can really hurt us. That's what I mean by direct hits. Actually, it's the other category that takes a little more explanation because that one's pretty understandable. Let me tell you what I mean by sneak attacks. These are not as obvious. They are at least somewhat more subtle and they're every bit as psychologically harmful and ammunition for the inner bully as direct hits. Okay, first one, guilt tripping. If a message you get from at least one of your parents comes on as you have disappointed me, oh, that's painful. That's an example of a sneak attack. So guilt tripping is one. Another one is negative comparisons. With a message you get from at least one parent is a message and it can come up often of how you stack up to your siblings, how you stack up to your friends, how you stack up to your classmates, particularly in terms of, so how come you're not doing as well as, why can't you be like? Those kind of negative comparisons where it's obvious the message is, you fall behind and I don't like that. That's, of course, what I mean by negative comparisons, that's another sneak attack. Another one, neglect. And what I mainly mean by neglect here is not extreme of neglect, but where you grow up as a kid and you may not be conscious of it, but you're being neglected, particularly in terms of getting the right amount of affection, attention, guidance, comfort, and discipline. That's what I mean by neglect. An insufficient amount of those really important aspects of parenting. One more, this, I'm sorry, two more categories, abandonment. In the, fortunately, it is pretty rare, but it's not, you know, not like it never happens where a child is outright abandoned by a parent. That's a pretty, as you can imagine, agonizing sneak attack. The last one is hypocrisy. But the basic message that comes from a parent is the proverbial, do as I say, not as I do. That's another sneak attack. Let me tie it all together. If a kid is on the receiving end of either category, direct hits, or any of the types of sneak attacks. Unfortunately for some, it's even both. What that does inside is it builds up something I kind of like to call an echo. And I really, of course, don't mean something literal, although for some people, even into adult life, they can still actually in a way hear that parent or that voice saying the kind of things that were being said in terms of direct hits and sneak attacks early on. What the inner bully is about is an accumulation of the direct hits, if there are, or the sneak attacks, if there are. It builds and it crystallizes into those three deserved messages. The inner bully kind of learns to sum it all up in those three deserved messages coming off from direct hits and sneak attacks. So this is so powerful. This is the, I can't wait to work with you next week because I, I require it. A lot of uh, people, including myself, have been psychologically damaged from elementary school children. Mm -hmm. um, I was just commenting on the, the live here. I, this sounds crazy. I'm 45 years old and I still in my head can hear, and it may have just been one day of children saying thunder thighs, thunder thighs, tree trunk legs, tree trunk legs. Mm -hmm. and, and if and if somebody like my husband or a friend jokes and says that to me, it sends me into orbit. Right. How, how do, first of all, what is it about the elementary school days that can hurt us so deeply? And how do we heal from that? Well, I think we all know what that's called and it's called bullying. And if there is anything, Emily, at any age that is going to be ammunition for our inner bully. It's the outer ones, the real ones. The inner bully sponges off any kind of bullying at any age. 
And in a sense, while I didn't use the term bullying a minute ago to talk about, again, those parental communications where there are direct hits or there are sneak attacks, let's call it like it is. In a sense, what I'm referring to by direct hits and sneak attacks is a form of bullying. So putting that together, if you grow up very early on in life and you're getting those kinds of quote bullying messages from a parent, you are no way around it. You are more vulnerable, not necessarily to being bullied, but you're more vulnerable to what bullying you do get hurting you even more. It's as opposed to, as if a child grows up and there's very little, and, and God knows how lucky and fortunate they'd be. If a child grows up with hardly any kind of direct hits or sneak attack communication, and that kid ends up starting to get bullied in school, yeah, odds are still gonna be hurtful and troubling, but the odds also are they're gonna be more resilient. That child not having grown up with essentially the disadvantage of having direct hits and sneak attacks, that child is likely to absorb the bullying better, better in terms of it's not gonna be quite as hurtful, quite as damaging. It's really an advantage in the face of being bullied. You know, you said something earlier that really, um, really resonated. I, I know a lot of people that are ex extremely, they grew up extremely attractive. Like I'm talking about people that, you know, you see the celebrities and the people that just were fortunate to, to be extremely attractive on the outside. Okay. Many of these people, as they begin to age, because they didn't have what you said, the inside, they, they got through life through external, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, the way they looked on the outside. As they begin to age, they never had the self-respect on the inside. Absolutely. So th and, and so funny enough, I watched a documentary last night on Pamela, Pamela Anderson Lee. And she is a, everything you have explained today. She, she grew up in the limelight and it was all about her external. Mm -hmm. And now she's a shell of herself. She is broken. She, she's having a hard time finding herself and knowing who she is because the world looked at her just on the outside, never gave her a chance on the inside. And now it's a mess. And you see this with a lot of people. It, do you find that, you know, because I think if somebody grows up maybe less attractive, they may work harder to find some things on the inside. So they're stronger as they grow. Um, it, does that make any sense? Total sense. It makes total sense. And staying with the example of, of Pamela Anderson, I mean, it, it's sad to me to hear that because either nobody guided or steered her, really probably at any point, no matter how you know, prominent a figure she may have been, nobody steered or guided her, or at least effectively steered or guided her to start at some point thinking more about what you're about on the inside. So since nobody steered and then, you know, got to put some accountability then on Pamela herself, certainly, apparently she never got around in adult life to steering or guiding herself into really building up what she's about on the inside, getting that inner self-esteem in a better place, realizing this places and reasons for her to feel some inner self-respect. Yeah, she paid apparently a very big price. And you're absolutely right, Emily. She's in a lot of company. Yes, uh, Mar Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe is another example. Um, Marilyn Monroe might be the, the entire summary of what you've talked about today. Because yes. all she ever wanted was to feel loved. Yes. And she was kind of a, a characterized cartoon joke to the world. And she died in her 30s and might still be alive had she been able to conquer what you call the inner bully and self-sabotage. Uh, I want to go right with that because it's it is. It's a very relevant example. I don't know a lot about Marilyn Monroe. 
I don't really know much of anything about Pamela Anderson, but here's one thing I do know about Marilyn Monroe. I, I saw a documentary a while ago. She was definitely an intelligent woman. I want to go with that. What's intelligence about? Intelligence about something very important on the inside. So if nobody steered Marilyn Monroe or anyone like Marilyn Monroe early in life to really look at and appreciate and cultivate the intelligence that really was there within her. I will assume the odds are if we'd have asked Marilyn Monroe, I'm sure people did in some way, ask Marilyn Monroe over the years, you think you're intelligent? I will bet she would have maybe tried to play around with the answer a little bit or whatever, but I will bet that Marilyn Monroe believed she was not an intelligent person, that she never acknowledged it, Nobody, maybe somebody along the way did, but there had to be, chances are, no acknowledgement. And I'm not only talking intelligence. I don't doubt, for example, there are very likable parts of her personality. Well, that's part, a big part of what you're about on the inside. So if nobody, including Marilyn herself or any Pamela's and Marilyn's out there who don't give themselves acknowledgement for those really positive appealing traits on the inside they stay at the mercy of having to look really darn good on the outside because that's again all their self-esteem is really about and then they could have maybe other people try to convince them you really need to look at what you're about on the inside but if they don't really focus on it then a Marilyn Monroe a Pamela Anderson does end up going through life really not realizing what they're truly about, what they what the blessings and gifts they have to offer on the inside. That's very sad to me. Uh, my last question to you is, is if we can work on the self-respect on the inside here at Just Lean In, do you think that will help us with the outside of what we're trying to accomplish? I think it definitely can. It's a little bit tricky though, because right back to the word socialization and conditioning, you know, <clears throat> there are enough people, including in the mental health field, certainly, and in other places that do try to encourage people to really, you know, focus more on what you're about on the inside. It really matters. Unfortunately, and we all know this, in all aspects still of all types of media, what's the message? And listen, I don't need to tell both of you, especially for women. The message women continue to get, it has changed in my mind, and I've had a lot of discussions with a lot of different women of different ages. It hasn't changed much at all that women continue to be socialized and conditioned to disproportionately focus on their external appearance in terms of what self-esteem is really about. It continues. So for any woman, or certainly man for that matter, to really build up what their self-esteem and self-respect is on the out on the inside rather you have to work at that you have to work at it you have to work at building it up because the conditioning and socialization is to get your mindset much more quickly on how do i look on the outside than to think about wow hey take a good look at me on the inside because i'm plenty worth knowing man this has been this might be the most favorite call that we've done since we started the company I will be working with you on Monday. I'm going to start my coaching with you. Um, your prices are reasonable, especially for what you offer. Can you share with us, how do we get your book? What about your coaching services? How can people reach out to you? Um, and we hope that you'll be our official psychologist for Just Lean In as we go along here, because I would like us to come on and do more of these if you're open to that. That's guaranteed. Oh, that's great. Yeah, guaranteed. So, okay, let me start. I have a website and it's mostly about my therapy practice, but it does make some reference to the coaching work I do. My website is www. And I'll, I'll just say it. It's all lowercase, no space. Sydney, S-I-D-N-E-Y, J-C-O-H-E-N, my last name, Sydney J. Cohen, PhD, no spaces.com. So that's my website. My, I'll tell you a couple other things. I have an email address. It's all again, lowercase. My email address, D-R-S-I-D, 
C-O-H-E-N, for Dr. Sid Cohen, D-R-S-I-D-C-O-H-E-N at Gmail. So that's my email address. Um, it's a little aside. I, have, I post a lot on Instagram. I have a lot of psychologically oriented posts of all different types. Some are definitely on the inner bully. Lately, I've been posting a lot on the subject of betrayal trauma. That's a subject I address a lot with people, including people struggling with losing weight. You made reference a little while ago, Emily, to trauma. There are, for enough people struggling to lose weight, unresolved trauma issues for sure. That is one of the areas I address in my coaching. So my Instagram page is drsid, all again, lowercase, no space, drsid.c. So that's for Instagram. And last but not least for the moment, so I have two books. They're both on Amazon and Kindle. Again, first one, the relevant, most relevant to weight loss, inner blocks to losing weight. And then my other book is Your Self-Sabotaging Inner Bully, Standing Up to It Once and For All is the subtitle. And there you have it. You, you're amazing. Jen, do you have any final thoughts before we uh, have to let this man go? I could listen to him all day. No, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, and, you know, we really appreciate it. I know we, we've had uh, somewhere between 15 and 30 people um, throughout this whole thing. So I know you've impacted um, at least them and then anyone who comes in the in the replay and anyone who reaches out to you. And we're, we're really here to make an impact on, on people's lives. So we really appreciate you helping us with that. Um, and it, this was amazing. So thank you so much for everything. We will be doing this again. Awesome. That sounds great. Well, thank you so much. Um, and um, Emily, I'll toss it right back to you just to close out. Okay. If you liked what you have heard today, um, I highly recommend that you get in touch with Doc. And I say Doc, my husband's a doc. I apologize. <laughs> That's how we talk. Um, I'm looking forward to my session with him this week. Um, he's very reasonable and he is going to be our official psychotherapist. Uh, psychologist for our group so we will be coming up with a certain time once or twice a month where we get to uh, pick his brain um don't um don't beat yourself up there is an inner bully let's fight that battle let's talk to our coaches about that in our small groups and let's win this battle and let's work on our self-sabotaging love you guys don't forget to just lean in just lean